Hi, welcome to the channel. I'm Lauro Miller and I make videos about programming. Today we'll start with the last big topic of this introduction series. We'll talk about asynchronous programming in JavaScript. For us to understand asynchronous programming, we need to understand how the language works behind the scenes. We need to talk about the event loops and also how it handles asynchronous tasks. And that's exactly the goal of today's video. So let's check the agenda for today and let's get started. Here are the main topics we will discuss in this part of the course. We will start by discussing what does asynchronous mean and actually and why do we need it, right? So why do we need asynchronous execution in JavaScript? We then move on to discussing the call stack. This is important for us to understand the order that functions are called in JavaScript. We then move on to discussing the event loop and that's perhaps the main part of this video which makes or which is extremely necessary for us to understand and to actually master asynchronous programming in JavaScript. We'll then move on to a quick example about how we can block the program execution and we will briefly discuss asynchronous execution with callbacks. As you can see, we will not dive into the details of promises and async await functions in this part. We'll talk about them in the next two parts. But here I just want to show you how you can use callbacks to actually execute asynchronous code. Callbacks are one of the patterns that we can use to execute asynchronous code, but promises and async await functions are becoming more and more popular. So it's important that we get a good understanding of the three of them. For this part, I'll be using this online application. The link to this application is in the description of the video. You can also see it here. It's quite easy to access and it's actually quite flexible, and quite powerful. It has a good explanation. If you click on the about here, for example, you can go through by, by yourself and read the description of each of these elements. In this part, we will see how everything comes together and what are some of the pitfalls we need to keep in mind when working with asynchronous programs in JavaScript. So let's start with a simple example here. I want to just demonstrate to you why we need asynchronous programs, right? So JavaScript is a single threaded language, which means that the JavaScript code, the program, it runs in a single process. You have multi-threaded languages as well, which have mul uh, multiple processes running the same program, but JavaScript is, is simpler. It has a single process. This means that if we have a long running process in our code, this is going to block the entire program until that process is done. In multi-threaded programs, this could be handled by executing this, this long running task in, a, in one thread and then in another thread, continue with the execution of the program. But of course, JavaScript does not support this because it is a single threaded program or a language. So there has to be another way for us to tackle the problem. Let's just try to visualize how we can actually block the whole execution of the program by having a, a, a part of our program running for a considerable amount of time. So let's start with a, a, a simple constant here. Let's call this now. And now it's just going to be date dot now. OK, so this takes the, the, the exact time of uh, the execution of this function and then it stores in a variable called now. And then we will simply execute a while loop and we'll say while date dot now date.now minus now is less than 2000, then we are going to execute this, this empty body, which means that we will keep executing the body for 2000 milliseconds. Okay, the, the now here, it returns the, the result in milliseconds. And as you can see here in the description, it says returns the number of milliseconds elapsed since the, the um, January 1st, 1970 and so on and so forth. So here, if we actually execute this code and keep comparing, the moment that this difference here is greater or equal to 2000, it means roughly that 2000 milliseconds or two seconds have elapsed. So let's here say console.log and the first line is going to, to say starting and we'll say the next line, the next line will print in two seconds. Right, like so. And then here we'll say console.log, I am the next line. If I save this and I come here to the to the console and I execute node sync.js, then you'll see we actually start with the program. We say the next line will print in two seconds, and then it hangs for a little and then it prints I am the next line. So if I were to run this again, 
then you see you can you can see that the program waits a little bit and if I were to actually increase this time here maybe to 10,000 milliseconds and I save this run again then of course it's not going to be two seconds sorry that's going to be 10 seconds so I'm going to save this and I'm not going to let you waiting for 10 seconds but this will probably finish soon the idea here is that if our task is long running, if it's a, it's a big processing task, let's say we'll process an image or something like this, or if it's a task that we don't know the duration in advance and it can be a short task or a long task, in a good example for this are network requests, then we cannot really rely on a synchronous logic. We need to actually have a way of executing asynchronous code behind the scenes in JavaScript. So now let's see how we can implement this, this function in an asynchronous way, meaning that it will not block the execution of the next part of the code and it will execute something else once this condition completes. So here I'm actually going to, so I'm sort of simulating a long running task. Let's say that something like this, sleep, and then this is going to be a function, right? So I just want to, I want to block the code for a certain amount of time. Let's say here I received the milliseconds and then the logic I'll just copy and paste from here. Now and then we'll say while blah 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 then uh, here that should not be 10,000 that's going to be so I can sleep for a certain number of milliseconds right here I could say for example here sleep for 10,000 milliseconds oops 10,000 and that's going to have the exact same effect as before. I'm going to save this I'm going to run the code and you will see that this is going to hang for 10 seconds until it prints the next line. So now the idea here in the IDE is that we want to actually find a way to continue executing this code without so so find a way to prevent the execution of the of of the subsequent code of being blocked by these long running tasks. And one example that we can we can implement here we will discuss more more realistic ways but I just want to show you how we can actually take this task and put it somewhere else and that is by using the set timeout method. So the set timeout method is going to execute a function after a certain amount of time. If I were to write this down here like set timeout like so then it receives two arguments. The first one is the function to be executed and the second one is the minimum time to the execution of that function. Even if I add zero here, because the set timeout is going to add this function to the task queue, and we'll talk about the task queue in a bit, this is not going to be executed immediately. It's going to be added to the task queue and then it's going to be executed at a later point in time, even if the timeout is zero. Let's then paste here, copy and paste the, the or cut and paste the sleep function so that we block the execution, let's say for five seconds here. And now we will see that the, the next line will print immediately, okay, Imme immediately like so. And here, so I am the next line and then I will also console.log, console.log here, I will print after at least five seconds, okay, because this is going to block the execution of the code for five seconds. But now we will see that we can continue the execution of our code here in the main execution and then this function is going to be executed afterwards. I'm going to save this and I'm going to be back here at the terminal. Let's run node sync.js and now you see that the I am the next line prints immediately so that the program continues it exe its execution and then it executes the task that was added by the set timeout function. So to answer the question, what does asynchronous mean? In very few words, asynchronous simply means take these long running tasks or whatever tasks for that matter and execute them outside of the main loop of the program. Of course, this is a huge oversimplification and it's not always the case that this is true, but at least thinking about it this way helps us understand what it happens when we execute asynchronous code in JavaScript. It simply means that as we continue the execution of our program here, so let's say that I were to, to have, for example, some, some variable here, let x, and if I were to, after this execution here, set x equals to 10, this simply means that I cannot count on x being equal to 10 when I continue the execution of the main program. So if I were to console.log x here, this is going to console or this is going to log undefined on my console. So if I were to run here, you will see that x is actually undefined. And that's because x is being set from within the set timeout function, which is executed after 
this line of code. So asynchronous thinking and the asynchronous mindset requires, uh, as, I, as I said in the previous video, it requires a shift in mindset. And of course, again, you will not get everything from the very beginning. If you are already familiar with this, then maybe this is, I'm, I'm actually, hopefully I'm managing to make you understand a little bit better how asynchronous programming works in JavaScript, but it takes time to get used it to this new mindset. Nonetheless, I hope it's slightly clear clearer what asynchronous programming means in JavaScript and why we need it. So let's move on to the next part and try to understand how the call stack works in JavaScript. For that, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to use this platform, which allows us to quickly visualize how the call stack develops over the execution of a program. So let's start with a simple synchronous program. So I'm going to declare a couple of functions here and I will use the ordinary function declaration because here it, it is going to print the name of the functions. And if I use arrow functions, the, the functions are going to be printed just anonymous, 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 doesn't add a lot of value. So I'm going to use the traditional, the ordinary declaration here, but you can also use arrow functions for everything. So let's say that I have a, a function called function A, and this function A is just going to console.log something. Okay, we're just gonna console.log A. And then we have a function B, which is going to call the function A. And then we have a function C, which is going to call the function B. Okay, like so. And then here from within our code, we're gonna call the function C. So as you can imagine, function C is going to be the first one to be called. So it's going to be the first one to be added to the call stack. Then once we are within the function C, we will call function B, which will then be added to the call stack. Then we call function A, which is then going to be added to the call stack. And we're gonna have three functions in the call stack. So function A is gonna do its thing, it's gonna console.log whatever we need to console.log, and then it's going to return. And once it returns, it is removed from the call stack. The same thing for B and the same thing for C. So let's see how this actually looks like when we try to execute the program. So the first step is we synchronously execute the script as though it were a function body. So the first step is it's going to execute, it's gonna execute the call to function C and it adds function C to the call stack. The next step is that from within function C, we execute a call to function B, then it adds the function B to the call stack. And then from within function B, we execute a call to function A and it adds function A to the call stack. Now, because function A has no additional function calls here, if we had another function, let's say function D here, and we called function D from within function A, we would also add function D to the call stack. But because function A has just console.log, then it's going to execute this function and then it will return. So it's gonna print something here, exactly. It prints A. And the nice thing about this about this tool is that you can print, you can, whatever you console.log, it's gonna console.log in this, this little, warnings here at the top, these little toasts. So maybe it also makes it easier to visualize what we are what we are logging. We don't need to open the developer console. Now the next step is actually to remove function A because it simply returns. And then we have function B. And because there is no additional code after the call to function A, function B is also going to return and it's gonna be removed from the call stack. The same thing for function C. So of course, once function C is done, then we are done with all the calls and the call stack is empty. And now we will here re-render the UI and return to step two. Another way of visualizing the call stack is, I think we did that in the past already, was to throw an error, right? So let's say stack.js here. I'm gonna copy the whole code from the, from the browser and from within function A, I'll actually throw a new error, okay? Just, and it's gonna be just to visualize, just to visualize the call stack. And we will see from the error that we can actually identify the stack based on the stack trace. So here let's run a node or let me clear everything and then let's run a node stack.js and you will see that here we throw a new error and then we print the stack trace on the screen. And then it says at A, at B, at C, right? So it means that function A is the, at the top of the stack, then we have function B right below it and then function C. And that's because that's the exact order of execution here. We first call function C, then function B, then function A. And a stack is a, a data structure which follows this LIFO structure, right? So this LIFO structure is the last in 
first out. That's why the function a is the the one the first one to to get removed from the stack. It is because it was the last one to enter. Nice. Hopefully this was um, understandable enough to to for us to get a grasp of how the call stack works in JavaScript. Of course, again. I think every single discussion that we have here, they are going to be simplifications of reality, but these are just brief explanations for, our, for us to get a, a bird's eye overview, so a general understanding of the main structures of a JavaScript execution. So here, let's mark the, the understanding the call stack is completed and let's move on to discussing the event loop. So back at the browser here, to understand the event loop, let's click on this about button and let's try to understand the different parts. So the first one, as we saw in the previous part, was to synchronously execute the script as though it were a function body, right? So it's gonna run the whole thing until the call stack is empty. Now, if during this execution, any script is added to the task queue here at the top, then the event loop is going to select the oldest task from the task queue and run until the call stack is empty. If some tasks are added to the micro tasks queue, then it will also run the tasks from the micro task queue. Now the difference is that between micro task and task is that all the tasks in the micro task queue are going to be executed before the next iteration. While in the task queue, only one of the tasks, meaning the oldest task is going to be executed. So let's try to simulate this by using that example that we have here from the, from the IDE. I'm gonna copy this and paste it here. And I'm going to remove the variable x because I'm just interested in executing this set timeout function. So I actually also don't need this and the sleep function I can remove. And then here I will have just something like this. And I will say, I will print last, right? So I'll print last starting. So I'll say, I will print, I will print first, then I will print last and then here I will print second, okay? I'll print second, like so. Now let's run the program and let's see what's going to happen. So it's gonna evaluate the script, it's gonna execute it. And as you can see, it's going to first print the starting, I'll print first, and then in the next step, it will execute the set timeout. Once I run the set timeout, you see here, that's the anonymous annoying thing that I, I said, I will fix this by declaring here, I actually a function. So let's declare function here, function, run last like so and then i can remove this here and that should be everything that we have to do so repeating it starting i'll print first then i add the run last function to the task queue and then i execute the last line of code so then i will print the second here the second line i'll print second and now i will actually come to the task queue. So once I execute the next iteration, then I'm gonna look at the task queue. Are there any tasks within the, the task queue? Yes, there is the run last task. So I'm going to execute the run last function here. And the run last function is going to console.log the line, okay? So as you can see, this function, even though we had a set timeout with zero here, it was executed last because it was executed in the next iteration of the program or of the event loop. Now you may be wondering, okay, that's that's really cool, but um, I don't use the set timeout as often as I use, for example, promises, and I would like to understand how promises are handled. So that's what we're gonna talk now. And here, let me try to give an example because promises, they are not added to the task queue. They are added to the micro task queue. Therefore, they are handled differently. Remember the micro task queue, it's emptied. It's emptied at every iteration of the event loop. Even if we have, even if we have 10 micro tasks here within the micro task queue, they will all run before we run the next task in the task queue. So let's give it a try. I'm gonna click here on edit and I'm gonna add a new promise here. And that's just for the sake of, of demonstrations. Here I'm just shortcutting the whole thing because I'm saying, okay, we have a promise we're gonna resolve and then I'm gonna call the then method here. And um, 
I apologize if you have never worked with promises. This is going to seem extremely mysterious, but I just want to show you how the whole thing it interacts. So how the, all the different parts of the program interact with each other. We will talk about promises in details in the next step, in the next part of the series. So don't worry if you don't understand it now, you will definitely understand everything in the next video. So here I'm gonna say function and this is gonna run actually in the third place and then I will console.log, I will print third, like so. So now let's try to understand the mechanics. If I click here to, to run this program and then you will, you will say, okay, both of the set timeout and the promise are asynchronous. So I would expect the set timeout to execute before the promise, but this is not what's going to happen because the micro task queue is always emptied before running the next iteration of the task queue. Let's see how this works in the program. So the first step is as always to console.log the starting here, I will print first, and then I add the run last function to the task queue. And then here I will add the run third function to the micro task queue because it is the result of a promise. Okay, now you see here it's added to run third. And then I will run the console.log, I will print second. Now, once I'm done running the console.log here, meaning that the call stack is empty in the main execution, in the, in the main part of the script, I will run all the tasks from the micro task queue. So now I will run the function run third, which means that the line here, this console.log is gonna be printed on the screen. And now I'm done with running the tasks from the micro task queue. I will re-render, that's again, as it says here, it's only for browsers, in Node.js you will not have the re-render step, but we'll still come back to step two. So now we will run one more task from the task queue, the oldest one. And if I were to then run the run last function, I will console.log the last line of code. For me, this sounds like really interesting because it entirely breaks the the, the sequential logic of the program, right? We have one line of code and then we print this line and then we print this line here and then we print the line number four, the last of all of them, even though it was the second one to be programmed here. So this hopefully illustrates why asynchronous programming can get extremely confusing if you're not careful about it because you really can have execution. So code being executed from everywhere at any point, of course not at any point, it follows these rules here, but you hopefully you get what I mean. We need to be careful to understand how the different parts of our code interact together. And we need to get in our minds that the position of, of a certain function, the position, the, the placement within a file, if we are using asynchronous programming, it's not the main aspect in, determine, in determining when that function is going to be executed. So even if we were to add actually five more promises here, let me try to add it here and, and try to add five more promises. So pa, 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 one, two, three, four. So let's add four more promises. And all of them are gonna print before we print this set timeout function. So I'll print third, I'll print fourth, and then I'll print fifth, and I'll print sixth, and I'll print seventh. Okay, sixth is enough, right? So let's uh, just do a little bit of um, sixth, then fifth, just for us to have a nice micro task queue. That's gonna be the fourth, and then the third. Okay, so now, Hopefully here the, the line is, yes, it is here on the bottom. I cannot um, edit this any longer. So let's try to run this and let's see how it executes. So first one, console.log, fine. Then we add the run last to the test queue. And then we have the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth to the micro task queue. And now we will run this, I will print second function. So if I were to run this, I will print second, okay. That's, that's executed. And now I'm gonna run all the micro tasks. So the third is gonna print, the fourth is gonna print, the fifth is gonna print, the sixth is gonna print. And then only when I'm done with all the micro tasks, I will actually run the set timeout. So once I run the last here, then it prints, I'll print last and then ends the call stack and the program finishes. So imagine that here within these promises, I have some tasks which take some time. 
Now, because all of them are executed before the set timeout, the set timeout is not going to be executed immediately. It's not going to be executed after zero milliseconds. It will actually take some additional time to be executed. Let's try to visualize this in the IDE because here, because of this um, whole interactive environment, we cannot visualize the time very well. Let's copy and paste this whole thing in the IDE and let's try to visualize it here. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna say, event loop.js and let's see how this code behaves. So let's bring back our sleep function. I'm gonna say here const sleep and I can use arrow functions again because now I don't need to worry too much about being an anonymous function. So that's a milliseconds. I'm gonna say now is equal to date.now and then I'll say while date.now minus now less or yes less than milliseconds then i will execute some empty block of code so now if i were to come here and within each of the promises i'm gonna sleep for let's say 500 milliseconds right 500 milliseconds 500 milliseconds 500 milliseconds and then 500 milliseconds as well Actually, before we do that, let's remove this and let's just see how fast the code is going to execute in general, okay? So I'm just gonna save it like this. I'm not using this sleep function. Let's come back here to the to the um, console, clear the whole thing and then run node event loop.js. You see that all of them, they print as, as expected. I'll print first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then the set timeout is gonna print last. So now let's say that we start with the sleep functions. I'm gonna put sleep. 500 and then here also sleep 500 sleep 500 and sleep 500 and then we will see that each of this sleep here is going to delay the execution of the next function so let's see if now it takes a little bit longer exactly now you see that each of the functions is actually executing 0.5 seconds after the other so if the functions within the promises uh, or, or the functions that are executed as a result of the promise or when the promise resolves or rejects, we'll talk about this in the next part, don't worry about it. Um, but if, if these functions here, they take some processing power, we can also block the execution of the program. So if we were to actually have functions that take two seconds to execute at every time, then this will still have a roughly let's say, quote unquote, synchronous execution, even if we are executing these functions in, in, um, after outside of the main execution, the main loop of the program, they will still take the two seconds to execute. So one way of doing this is that I could actually execute this again, this sleep process here, I can execute this in another, so outside of the main loop, and I could actually do, let's say, set again a set timeout or a promise here and i know that this is getting extremely confusing but i just want to show you how we can benefit because now once the first once the result of the first promise is executed then you will see that the second one here it it goes directly it goes directly it prints directly the third one so if i were to actually follow this this uh, pattern here this pattern here i'll print everything and then I will have a, a bunch of executions of the set timeout afterwards. The program is gonna hang for some time, but I will not block the execution of the code within this function body. If I save this and then I run the whole thing, you see that we print all of them and then the program is gonna hang because it's executing those set timeout stuff, but we don't block the execution of the code. And now perhaps you will start seeing how all this asynchronous logic can lead to a, a very hard to understand code. Because imagine that as a result of some, some operation that is a promise or there is a set timeout. So let's say that I have some result here that I then need to execute or then I need to use for another long running process. And then I have a result, a result here which I need to use for another running uh, long running process. So long running, long running, long running, it can get very easily, it can get very nested. So we can have very nested code, lots of functions, and this leads to what is known as, as the callback hell or even the, the promise hell because even within promises we would have the then and then from within here we would have promise.then and promise.then and so on and so forth. We would nest a lot of functions and then of course it becomes 
uh, virtually impossible to understand how the actual flow of the program looks like. So bottom line is that asynchronous programming is extremely powerful and it can help us execute long running processes without blocking additional execution of the code, but we need to be careful about how we actually structure the whole thing. There is no one size fits all solution. It, the, the, it comes with practice, it comes with trial and error, and it comes with, uh, I think, a little bit more of a um, thinking outside the box philosophy so that we look at the code and we see how we can simplify this deeply nested, deeply entangled logic. Awesome, now that we know the basics of the event loop, again, it's a simplification here, but I think it covers most of the cases that you come across. Let's talk briefly about blocking the program's execution. And as you saw already, we can block the execution by having these long running tasks. And here in, it was the case before that it was printing two seconds after two seconds after two seconds. And here there is one example in the browser and the link is also in the description that why this is important from a browser's perspective, right? So if we have a long running process in the browser, we can actually block the execution or we can block the user interaction. That's horrible for user experience. So here you see that there is a button. I can click the button, there's no problem, right? I can click this link here. If I were to come here to, to the GitHub repository, that is the source code. You're very welcome to visit this. But the moment I click on this block for five seconds, then I cannot do anything. I'm clicking here, it doesn't work. I'm clicking on the button, it doesn't work. And then after five seconds, we are actually back. So let's see again. Here, if I click on block for five seconds, I'm trying to block. It's still a little hand here. You see, it doesn't improve anything. And once it's back, I'm able to click on the button. So you can imagine that for the user, it's probably extremely annoying to have this entire UI blocked for five seconds. Quick example, I know I just want to show you that, well, this is a, a simple HTML page, but this can happen also in React, in Angular, in Vue, in any of these frameworks that use JavaScript heavily. Perhaps this also helps explain why some of the UI updates are not as smooth as we would expect. So it's important to understand how JavaScript interacts and updates the user interface on the browser. Let's briefly talk about asynchronous execution with callbacks. And for that, I'm gonna use the ID here. I'm gonna create a new file and I'm gonna say callback. Okay, callback.js. And for demonstration purposes here, I want to use a simple, a, a simple module from, from Node, which is the file system. We didn't talk about how we can use modules in Node yet. We're gonna talk about this in a few steps from now. But for the sake of, of demonstration here, we can just simply say fs is equal to require the module fs. So this is going to import the module fs from the node system and then we'll be able to execute some functions and interactions with the file system. Let's also say that we have a new file here and I want to have a, an example.txt. So just a text file with my example like so. Right, so now I have some content I want to print on the screen and I want to read the contents of this file. So here in the fs module, we have a function called fs.read, right? And this read, and I think it's actually read file and the read file function, it takes a, a file path that we can say example.txt and it receives a callback function. And the callback function, I'm gonna pass like this. The callback function receives two parameters in this case. The first one is the error and the second one is the content, right? The second one is the content of the file. So let's say that we have for some reason an error. Let's say that we pass the invalid name of the file, right? So this error here is going to be populated. If the, the name of the file is valid and everything is okay with the file, there are no errors, then the content is going to be populated with the contents of the file. So the idea of this whole execution is that I'm going to call the read file. The read file function is going to go to some someplace else and it's going to execute the whole logic to read the contents of the file. Once it finishes reading the contents of the file, it's going to add this callback to the task queue with the correct parameters. So let's see here, we'll say if there is an error, we will console.log error on the screen. 
else, if there is no error, we will console.log the content dot to string. And here we can say, oops, not console.lot, but console.log to string utf8. And that's just the encoding that we're gonna execute or that we're gonna use. So let's save this and let's see how this works here. I'm gonna clear and then I'm gonna run node callback.js. And as you can see, as expected, it prints my example. Now, because this is an asynchronous execution, if I were to console.log here, I'll say I will print before the content. Okay, so this function here, it is still after, so it's it's declared, it's coded after the, the function read file, but it's gonna print before, and that's exactly because the read file goes and executes something else in another part of the of, of the of the execution or uh, in, in, in some place else where exactly it's hard to say, but it executes this logic in some place else. And once it's done, it adds this, this, this function here to the task queue. So once I save this and I execute, you see I will print before the content and then I print my example. If I have an error here, for example, if the name of the file is invalid and I run this program, then it's gonna print the error on the screen. As a last example for today, let's see how the HTTPS module would work in Node. Okay, so HTTPS is, I think, the, the built-in library in Node to make HTTPS requests. And here you will probably use another library, so another module, maybe Axios, maybe, maybe GOT or some other solution. But here I just want to show you because also HTTPS works with callbacks. So if I were to here have the https.get and then let's try to to get the contents of the google page so www colon forward slash was www.google.com and then here we receive a callback as well which is going to be executed once there is a response here so let's say that i have res and this is going to be the incoming message now the incoming message it works a little bit differently because it does not have directly the data that we want, but it, we need to add an event to it. So res.on data, and then here we need to actually print the data. Okay, so I'm gonna say um, data here, and then we need to print this data on the screen. Now, how do you do that? Well, one way of doing it is simply using console.log data.toString. Right, so there are other ways. You can also have a look at the library itself online. I mean, Normally, when you are writing code, you would use a more advanced library, which offers other possibilities. But here, I'm just using this again, I repeat, because it works with callbacks. And I just want to show you how callbacks can be used. So I'm going to save this. And now I will be back to the terminal and I will execute node callback.js. And I apologize for the big output in advance, but let's try to understand it, okay? Uh, here, what it actually is doing, so let's go to the beginning of the execution, and there it is. Then you see our print before the content, my example as expected, and then here we actually start with an HTML page. So it's just printing the HTML that it received from Google. Of course, this is here, if we analyze this, there is a lot of JavaScript involved. So here is JavaScript, right, function, and so on and so forth. But the idea is that it's printing the page that we receive when we try to execute Google on the browser. Now you will see here that my example is printing before the result of this, of this function here, even though it is coded after. And that's because this function, so the reading the file, it finishes its ex execution before the HTTP GET function finishes its execution. Now, why is it so? Well, this function just happens to be executed uh, more quickly, right? So um, network requests, they may take a long time, they may take less time, it depends on your network connectivity, but here it, it is the case that the read file is being executed more quickly than the HTTP GET request. Even though it's coded after the HTTP GET request in the code, it still, it, it still prints first because it it manages to add the callback before the HTTP adds its own callback to the task queue. And because the task queue runs only the oldest task in the queue, then the one that gets added first is actually executed first. So in the task queue, in the task queue, differently from the call stack, in the task queue, we have a FIFO logic, which means a first in 
first out logic. The, fir the, the, the task, the function that is added first is the first one to be removed and, ex and executed. Hopefully not too confusing. I you know there is a lot of content here, something it's it's entirely new, this mindset of asynchronous programming. But hopefully I was hopefully I was able to give you a good understanding of how the callback pattern works. So the idea is pretty much the same. We execute some logic outside of the main loop of the program. Once that logic is done, it adds the callback with the respective arguments to the task queue, and then it's going to execute that callback in the next iteration. So uh, the number of arguments that a callback receives and the number of parameters it expects, it really depends on the underlying implementation of the library and of the function. So it, it can vary. For example, for the read file function, the callback expects as the first argument error. So if there are any errors, they are going to be passed to the first argument and the content to the second argument. On the other hand, for the HTTPS module, the get method expects a callback with one argument, the argument that is going to receive the, the information about the incoming message. The callback pattern is not the only way of executing asynchronous code in JavaScript. We also have events. For example, here, whenever there is new data incoming or whenever uh, the, the, the incoming message emits an event data, then we can execute some function. We also have promises and we also have async await, which is another syntax for promises. Now the promises and the async await we're going to discuss in the next steps and events I will actually skip for this introductory course, but we'll discuss them later on. But of course, if you want to know more about events, feel free to go and do some research on Google. There are great resources online that you can use to understand how events work behind the scenes. That's it for today. I know it's a big change in the mindset from synchronous to asynchronous programming, but I hope I was able to give you a good understanding of the mechanism behind the scenes. Of course, we'll come back to it over and over again. In the next video, we'll talk about promises, but in future series, we'll also work a lot with asynchronous programming when we are developing specific applications. So don't worry about it. If there is anything that's not clear at the moment, you will definitely get it with time and with practice. In the next video, as I said, we'll talk about promises. And if you don't want to miss that, make sure to subscribe to the channel and you'll get a notification when the video is out. Thanks for your time and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.